Kastner, who is a professor at Umea University in Sweden, and uh, who works uh, particularly on the uh, interaction between membrane protein and their membrane surrounding. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, about the effect on cancer and uh, BCL2 uh, protein. So he's going to tell us about this. After his talk, we are going to have a um, few questions and answer. And then the second talk will be given by Jean-Michel Jo, uh, who is uh, CNRS uh, research director in uh, Lyon, working on uh, ABC transporter. Uh, and the ABC transporter uh, would a low resistance to drugs, so either antibiotics or uh, chemi uh, chemicals uh, used for cancer treatments. So he's going to give the second talk. We'll have a second uh, short question-answer period and then a more intense question-answer session with uh, the two speakers answering uh, deeper questions. So let's start with Gerhard Kostner. Gerhard, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I want to talk about our work where we look for proteins involved in regulation of apoptosis and their interaction with the mitochondrial outer membrane, which is shown here as a schematic thing. And program cell death or apoptosis is an extremely important process in our life because especially during our development, it's responsible for sculpturing our tissues and limbs and also removing cells and tissues we do not need anymore during our development after they are produced. And after we are born, apoptosis is also very important in keeping our cell homeostasis to keep our healthy cells alive and to get rid of dysfunctional thick cells and so on. So we have programmed cell this our whole life to do something. And that this programmed cell this is not getting out of control. Nature developed two main systems to regulate programmed cell this. One is this extrinsic pathway, this death receptors where signals come from outside the cell and then do something inside the cell to destroy the cell. And the other is the intrinsic or mitochondrial pathway, which I do research on, which is more or less the pathway will switch off the mitochondria, which are like the powerhouse of a cell that produces energy, ATP, and then finally kills the cell. So, and how is this working? And if you look at a sketch of a mitochondria and look at the outer mitochondrial membrane, during apoptosis, proteins, from a specific family, BCL2 family, like bugs, they will form pores or like make holes. And in these holes, cytochrome C from the inner part of the mitochondria can get leaked out, start this apoptotic process. So mitochondria becomes also dysfunctional. So it does not produce energy anymore. And finally, the cell will die. And in your normal cells, this should not happen. You should have happy mitochondria like this. So nature developed this family of BCL2 proteins, which regulate this process. And you have like two main fractions. You have a pro-survival or anti-apoptotic family, which like the main protein is the BCL2 protein, b lymphoma protein, which also gives a name to the family. And then you have this pore or cell killing proteins called apoptotic proteins, where like Bucks protein, which is shown here, is the main culprit or the most exa famous example. And if you look at the sequences at both, you see they look quite similar. So only Bux is missing one of this with the BH4 domains, but they all have soluble parts and they have a transmembrane domain. So they're quite similar, but have extremely opposite function. So now can you think about why is this important? Because program or apoptosis is working very well in our nature. Problem is sometimes it goes wrong, especially if you have non-treatable cancer. Cancer cells are often quite good in overproducing this pro-survival or cell-protecting protein B-cell 2. So they can fend off all drug treatment and so on, which should trigger apoptosis. So more or less, they have enough bodyguards to kick all the cancer drugs out. 
Then on the other side, you have a lot of diseases where cells die but shouldn't die. For example, amyl diseases or the others. But I say one suggestion is that the B cell 2 protein, this survival protein, is stopped or inhibited. And then the Bax protein can make its holes and kill, for example, these neuronal cells or then ALS and so on. So, but it is not finally confirmed, but it's also one of the suggestions why some diseases have cells which die prematurely. And we are interested now more than the regulation on the molecular level. And for this purpose, we have a working model. So this is our working model, simple mitochondrial outer membrane. Then we say we have our complex in a healthy cell, B cell 2 and Bax, which inhibit each other. And our working hypothesis is that if you have intracellular oxidative stress, your membrane can get damaged, you produce oxidized lipids. And these oxidized lipids then more or less will increase the affinity of Bax with some other signals to the membrane. So you say you will not only have bugs which get neutralized by bugs, a B cell too, but you will also have a lot of more bugs which will free. And with other proteins, then it can form pores and finally kill the cell. On the other side, you can have, if you too much B cell too in the cancer set, if you say bugs comes, but you have enough B cell too, you could neutralize it all away. And our research is now focusing on three points. One is how is B cell 2, which is like in the membrane waiting for bugs? How is the structure, how it's behavior behaving? Because it's not much known. The other is how bugs, what is bugs doing on the membrane? And the final thing would be in what is a complex doing on the membrane? So what we do, we start with B cell 2. And B cell 2, like the whole family, belongs to so-called C-tail anchored membrane protein family, which goes from the cytosol into the mitochondrial membrane. We thought, and some assume only the tail goes in, but from a lot of molecular biology studies with labeling, it's clear if it goes to the membrane under apoptosis, it will go deeper in the membrane with some helices. It will not stick like an anchor and the head will look out. And the question was now, because there's no structure known on this B cell 2 protein, how can we use neutron reflectometry and NMR to get some insight into the B cell 2 protein when it's at the membrane? So with neutrons, we can get an overview. Is it sitting above the membrane, half in the membrane, or deeply buried? And with NMR, we can get indirect some information, but we can also get some structural and some dynamic information on a local level. How are the different residues behaving? So and what did we do now? We need the protein, and this was a big problem because B cell 2 is not soluble. And so people use the truncated chimeric version without the loop and without the transmembrane part. But so we started 2012 with self free expression to get the full protein. And then Jürgen is like postdoc in my lab. He managed finally to transfer the system to E. coli system. So we can now milligram amounts of full length human functional B cell 2 produce. And we can also reconstitute it back into membranes. And as you see here, and then make our proteoliposomes, which we then need for NMR and for neutrons. And then if you show a result from the neutron reflectometry measurements, we are doing at Harvel Isis with Luke, Hannah, and Mario. And what you see quite nicely here from the analysis that the protein B cell 2 is sitting in the membrane, tails B cell 2, and there's nothing looking outside the membrane. So it looks like it's really an integral membrane protein deeply buried, like shown here in the sketch, and not sitting above the membrane like you would expect from a tail anchored protein where the head should look out. And this was a little surprising, but here a little bit data because they confirm that they say you have a little more well, the most interesting is that the thickness of the tails goes a little down if the protein in, and it's still very low hydration inside of the protein, so it's a very dry system. We thought, but what was quite important and surprisingly, how to get this picture together with like what is in the literature that it should be tail anchored and the functional part should look out. This is why we thought we have to look with NMR also into it can we more or less understand or confirm 
the neutron reflectometry that the protein is inside or is something wrong. And with NMR, we can use dynamics. So if you show if it would sit as an integral membrane protein, it would have a slow dynamic or local residues dynamic. But if it would sitting above, you would have a very fast dynamic. So it's a head should rotate fast and be very flexible. And what you can do with NMR, you can use two different NMR experiments, which is a dynamic filter. You can look with cross polarization at rigid systems, which do not move much, or they would like sitting in the membrane. And you can look with inept, can look as very dynamic residues, such as you see very flexible. So if you say you have a very rigid system, you see like big bumps like here with CP. And if you say you have a very flexible system, you see very sharp lines, which like emphasize a mobile and makes them visible. And if you do now the experiments, this is the CP experiment, you see at low temperature in your BCL2 and DMPC membranes, you see a lot of peaks from the labeled protein, very intense, which also at higher temperature remain without changing much. Here you see pure lipid as a reference without the protein. And this means that most residues are quite rigid. Doesn't matter if you have them at four degree or at higher temperature, they become perhaps a little locally dynamic, but they do not move. It's sitting quite rigid, probably in the membrane. If you do now the NMR experiment for the flexible residues, you see extremely low signal at four degree. Uh, there's not much loops which do anything. It increases a little at 288. And if you increase a little more, if it's a membrane, it becomes fluid because DMBC is melting at 23 degree. But it's still not much signal compared to the cross polarization. So this means most residues in the protein are not flexible. And from some other experiments, we concluded that this sharp peaks we see must come from a flexible loop region which the protein has. It has a regulative intrinsic disordered loop region, which is very big. This is like 60 amino acid. That this probably must sit somewhere on the membrane surface or outside. And that's why we made a model now. Let's say for molecular biology studies that some helices go in from our neutron studies. That is says a big protein has to sit inside and our NMR for the loop. So to say, the protein is sitting buried inside the membrane, but the loop has to look at the interface outside, which would also make sense from the function that the protein's body would, for example, block Bugs protein, which is also thought to go in the membrane, or that would happen with all its interaction on the membrane level. But the regulation of the BCL2 would happen via the loop region from the cytosol because it can phosphorylate the loop, P53 can bind. So a lot of signals have to come from the cytosol. So it's like we thought model we concluded now or the function model which would come from the neutron and the NMR combined, which we also have now manuscript which we soon want to send off. Okay, now we say it's nice. And now we can look at the opposite side at bugs. So and if you go at bugs, this was a similar experiment, not done with CAR, but with N15. So was R2 and Tobias involved. And they used bugs protein as a soluble protein, but it's membrane active. So they added labeled bugs to vesicles, which contained oxidized lipids, for example. And then you could see with inept, you see a lot of peaks, but it's flexible. And with CP, you see also a lot of peaks or big bump. So you say, okay, the protein is partially in the membrane buried, but it also must have a lot of part of the protein must look outside and it's very flexible. And if you make this model now, if you look here, you can see bugs is partially in the membrane with some loops, but uh, some helices, but also outside, not like BCL2. And this model of bugs by NMR is also confirming earlier studies, which was done John Casaras and colleagues with Sons 2012. And they just suggested for the bugs already a mushroom model where part is sitting outside and some helices go in. So it's more or less a confirmation and more or less inside said it looks like bugs when it goes to the membrane, it puts some helices inside, which are rigid and keep some of his protein body outside or for functional things or to make a pore. So if you now want to continue this with neutron, 
we also have to think about these membranes which I mentioned that we think oxidized membranes are damaged and they help bugs to bind to the mitochondrial outer membrane and make this pore. And what we do very simple, we use model membranes. So we use our PC, PE, catalipin, like you say, you would have mitochondrial outer membranes, and then we add some oxidized lipids. So we use either PACE PC, which would have like a carboxyl group as SN2 chain, but it's like a quite a, a charged group at the end of a hydrophobic chain, or the aldehyde group. So it means this polar or charged groups makes the membrane quite distorted and disordered and change a lot of properties. And if you say we go now into a biological assay so, or biophysical assay, what we do, we look for leakage. So we make vesicles with these oxidized lipids and add bugs to it. And what you see very nicely, if you put PACE PC on it, you say you get a lot of leakage compared to none. But surprisingly, if you put POXNA on it, you get no leakage. And PACE we understand, but POXNA still not. And that's why we thought we have to look with more methods in. And then we started also to do neutron work again. So we are doing it more or less the same way as before. Neutron reflectometry for the global picture and NMR for the molecular. And use neutron reflectometry to look where might the bugs be in the membrane before and after you have the presence of oxidized lipids. And I show only short few results. This is now quite different. This is like you have cardiolipin or a mitochondrial membrane without oxidized lipids. And you see very nicely from this plot that the protein is sitting together with the lipid also above the membrane. Although not like BCL2, which you say you don't have anything here, it's all sitting inside. It must be that the bugs sits partially in the membrane, but also it forms some complexes with lipids above the bilayer. So it's transporting some lipid material outside its single bilayer, which was quite surprising, but also quite interesting. And from the analysis comes out that with these bugs, we titrated to it, bound it, and washed then away the excess bugs, that the membrane lost around 20% of its lipids composition. We could not figure out if it's all lipids or if it's more cardiolipin. This we would need send some other assays to do it, but at least it's quite a lot and it's quite interesting mechanism. And then we were doing similar things with oxidized lipids. So for example, you see here with PACE PC, which also the bugs makes pores in vesicles. And you see a similar picture. So bugs also be transport lipids outside. It's a quite similar feature, perhaps a little different distribution and it deposits all above the membrane. So this still needs a little analysis. How big are the differences to the picture without oxidized lipid present? But then we also have POXNO PC. Pictures also quite similar. For the face. also with a transporting lipid out. So the general mechanism of bugs at the membrane seems to be quite similar, independent if you have oxidized lipids or not. If the affinity, is different, but we thought from how it works, it looks quite similar. If on this, we still have to work on it, what this exactly means. So, but if you summarize now our work in simple terms, you can say we got some information out the BCL2, some information about bugs. We thought, and if you say we still have to do the work when BCL2 and bugs as an inhibitor are together in the membrane. Because this is the normal case in your healthy cells. If they say nothing happens, the cells do not die. They live happily because these two opposite proteins neutralize each other. And we found that what is quite important with the BCL2 is not only where it's sitting, so it's also when it interacts with bugs, it needs a huge conformational plasticity. It has to change its structure to bind to a specific BH3 peptide domain from bugs to get it in a hydrophobic groove. And this is also very important for these proteins. They can change the structure a lot from the cytosolic form into the membrane and how they work in the membrane. Then it's also clear this has something to do how does the structure look in the membrane and how does it change if it's regulating or inhibiting other proteins. Then it's what we still work on it how much influence has a membrane on this whole process? For example, 
if you say you have cholesterol, which makes the membrane stiff, will it change a lot? And say, or for example, a lot of cholesterol, will it block bugs from making pores? We saw it. And then the other big questions where a lot of drug development goes on, how does this interface between BCL2 and bugs looks? Because there's like Abbott and others have been drugs, drugs which more or less interfere with this interface. So they develop drugs which blocks this interface so bugs gets released and can make its pores and kill cancer cells. Then finally, I have to thank a lot of people. It's on the group, a lot of people are involved from Jürgen Armek and former postdoc PhD and Tobias. And especially from the neutron people, I have to thank a lot Luke, who helped for all experiments. Then also Hannah, who helped a lot. And then also Mario at RAL, and also Tommy Nulander, who was sometimes often at RAL and helped with spare parts if we had missed something. Then I also have to thank a lot the funding. Then also ISIS, because where we had a lot of support and beam time and held an ESS, where we got all the other supports in Lund. And I thank you all for listening now. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, now the questions, please. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, if there's questions, uh, you can write them on the question and answer um, uh, panel. Uh, maybe I can start. Um, you showed you're using uh, NMR for the molecular model. That's yeah. a, a very efficient method. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, for the complex, do you mm -hmm. think you could uh, make use of this new invisible nanodisc? Uh, I was thinking about what uh, until now it didn't work so well. I think the nanodisc we tried with Gothenburg, you could not fill nicely with BCL2. So what yeah. we do a lot for solution, Mar, we use a small detergent to make small micelles. Okay. But the nanodisc we have, with the discussion, all of because of the cryo EM, we have a huge cryo EM facilities and a lot of people use this also for cryo EM. So you also probably probably want to give it to the cryo M to look if you get some structural information out. Oh, yeah, the cryo -M. To be able to add some uh, oxidized lipids also to see the change. Yeah, but first I would need the structure because, I, uh, because the structure is not known of BCL2 in the membrane or because it's only a solution structure known of a shorter non-functional variant. Uh -huh. Not in vivo, which is, has no loop and no transmembrane part. We thought because the fool is quite tricky. So we thought, I think okay. we do a lot of titration with ligands. So you see structural changes, but we need, we thought, the structure to say what happens if we change the membrane, what happens if we add bugs to it. There's more or less what we work on at the moment. Okay. I see we have one question. Uh, uh, one of the attendees asking if you tried crystallizing BCL2. Yes, but until now okay, it was so, unsuccessful. <laughs> yeah, e even in uh, in uh, with lipids, well, with a lipidic environment like mesophase. Uh, no, we thought we we have a colleague in medicine. He does membrane proteins, Ronnie, and he gives us all this funny detergent, and then he gets the samples back. And until now, we didn't get any. We got some salt crystals, but no protein crystals. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I see. Well, the, mm -hmm. yeah, your heart, we don't hear you anymore. Okay, now, I was reading a question from Frank, it was affinity of bugs. This I have to look, but it's, it's much less than two, two membranes with oxidized lipids. If, but this is more or less like the rate where it's making diffusion in the pores and how many pores we got it. We wanted to do surface plasmon resonance, but we have not succeeded yet to get a proper assay on this. And we have the affinity from bugs to BCL2 in detergent. This is the nanomolar region, I think 35 or something, but we thought with the membranes, as we still uh, could not really figure out because it would be quite a nice assay to do it independent because bugs we have enough to titrate to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, there are also questions uh, linked with the lens project. Do you have the 
Deuterated lipids, you would like to make your model membrane for, for reflectivity? Yeah, I think at ESS, they produce some deuterated lipids now for us, also POPC, PPE, and these catalipins. And the measurement I showed BCL2, this is was fully deuterated DMPC, which you can buy commercially or chain deuterated. Yeah. Also this, the deuterated lipids I have now here, they were all bought by Avanti more or less. We thought about Lund, they made us, also Hanna, they made us some other lipids deuterated, which you cannot buy commercially. Okay. But we still have not tested yet. We wanted to test, but our beam session in May got to cancel at ISIS. Okay. So do that. Uh, and the oxidized lipid you are using, do you have a deuterated version? No, no, nobody wants to do them. It's Avanti. <laughs> It's and although it's not much, we have maximum 10%, and I learned it from the neutron people, you would not see much difference. Because if you have only 10% deuterated in a protonated membrane environment, it's probably probably not enough to get much difference. Mm. Yeah. You have okay. to deuterate much more into it. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Uh, NMR, is it necessary to have a bilayer? How many milligram of sample are needed? So it's more technical. Yeah, normally we use always, okay, we fulfill the rotor, we try to get 20 milligrams of protein and lipid hydrated in 20 to 30 milligrams with all together. So we can okay. feel a 3.2 millimeter magic angle spinning rotor for NMR. Okay. Because it's correlated how much you get in, how much signal you get out and this anyway, also this 1D spectra are easy to make with less, but we do a lot of 2D and then you need a lot of material that you can run it over two, three days before the sample is disintegrating. And for bags, you can measure it either in presence of lipid or in absence, right? Yeah, in, in absence, we, do, we, we make small liposomes with dye in it, and then you can add bags and measure the leakage. There's actually people doing it in Prague for us, they do it with fluorescent microscopy and they can also trace single vesicles. They can do all kinds of things and make normal leakage. So they can also use different dyes. So you can also determine the size of the pore by changing the dye inside the vesicles or with large vesicles. They can also make it opposite to have the dye outside and look how the dye goes inside the vesicle. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. We are going to go for the second talk and you stay with us uh, for the final question answer session. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good luck, Sean so, Michel. <laughs> <laughs> the second talk will be given from by Jean-Michel Jean Jones. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share the screen first. Uh, So is it okay? Do you see my? Uh, you can I see, see it. It's fine. It's okay. Fine. Okay. Good. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, uh, Anna, and Anna for the invitation to 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 speak about uh, multi-drug ABC uh, transporters. Um, so this is the outline of my short presentation. So first of all, I will give you a brief uh, background about the ABC superfamily. Then I will move on to the polyspecificity of a eukaryotic transporter, which is called the P-glycoprotein, so abbreviated PGP. So this is a multidrug transporter, which is involved in the resistance of cancer cells to chemotherapeutic treatment. Then I will give you some uh, ideas about what we know about the 3D structure of ABC transporters and how the catalytic cycle uh, for drug efflux might work. Then I will move on to uh, our favorite transporter, which is a homologous transporter to the P-glycoprotein. This is a bacterial transporter called BMRA. And I will uh, finish by showing you some data, sense data that we obtain on, uh, on BMRA. So first of all, the ABC transporter. So ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. So this is transporter that you find uh, everywhere in the living organism from bacteria to mammal. And those transporters are involved either in the uptake or the uh, efflux of molecules. So this, it, it, it can be uh, any kind of molecule you can think of, for instance, peptide, sugar, or whatever. Um, 
in uh, bacteria, they, uh, the transporters are either involved in the uptake or the efflux, whereas in the mammal, they are mostly, almost essentially involved in the efflux of, uh, of molecule. So all these transporters, they share a common topology with two transmembrane domain here and two uh, cytosolic domains. So these two cytosolic domains are called the nucleotide binding domain because in order to work, to, to, to uh, efflux or to import molecule, the, the port need energy and the, the, this energy is provided by ATP. So the nucleotide binding domain, they will bind and hydrolyze ATP to power the transporter. What you can see here also is that these four domains can be born in separate polypeptide, as shown here for the oligopeptide permease. But you can have different combination uh, uh, until you find the all uh, four domains uh, linked on a single polypeptide chain, for instance here for the PGP or CFTR. So these two members are prominent members in the family. So you probably heard about CFTR, which is involved uh, in cystic fibrosis upon mutation. And so the other very important members is the pig glycoprotein. So as I said before, which is involved in the multidrug efflux and found overexpressed in some uh, cancer cells. Uh, okay, so regarding the pig glycoprotein, so at least, but I think the list is much longer right now, but at least in 1998, uh, uh, 19, more than 100 compounds were already described for being actively excluded by this transporter, the p glycoprotein. So for instance, you have here the compounds that are used in uh, cancer uh, therapies like doxorubicin, paclitaxel, dodetaxel, etoposide. So all these drugs can be transported by the PGP, so efflux by the, the p glycoprotein. But you have also a lot of different families of compounds like alkaloide, here, resorpine, peptides, steroid hormones, dyes, and also antibiotics. So this is some examples of the structure of the compounds that are effluxed by the pig glycoprotein. So as you can see right away, there is no common scaffold uh, that are shared be, be, between all these molecules. So it shows you how polyspecific, what is the diversity of the compound that can be uh, expelled by the pig glycoprotein. And in fact, it has been proposed that the pig glycoprotein will work as a sort of vacuum cleaner and that it will scan permanently the, the, the um, the plasma membrane, and as soon as it encounters uh, a noxious compound, then the compound will be a flux outside the cell. So what do we know about the structure of uh, uh, ABC uh, uh, exporters? So the first structure was solved in 2006 by the group of Kaspar Locher. And in fact, it's uh, the structure of uh, uh, nomodimer, so two identical subunits with one transmembrane domain fused to a the cytosolic domain, so the nucleotide binding domain. And in fact, I just colored the two monomers differently, so in, in bluish color and in reddish color, so you can spot the, 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 the important feature for the structure of the transporter. And you can see, in fact, that there is uh, a domain swapping which is uh, made here at the level of the intracellular domain 2. This uh, intracellular domain 2 protrudes from the transmembrane domain here in red and interact in trance with the second nucleotide binding domain. So this is shown on this scheme here, the domain swapping of ICD2 here with the other uh, nucleotide binding domain here. So this structure was solved in a so-called ATP bound conformation, meaning that we have two ATP molecules that were trapped at the interface of the two nucleotide binding domain. And in fact, when you do a rotation, you see that this ATP bound conformation here allows the transporter to be open towards the outside of the cell. So this is a conformation prone to drug release. So this is the church structure that I just showed you, so the safe structure of in 206, but additional structure has been solved for other uh, drug exporters, and in particular for a transporter which is called MSBA. And in that case, you see that the structure is quite different. This time the structure is open towards the inside of the cell. So this is a so-called inward facing state. And it's in fact, supposedly the resting state of the transporter. So uh, when we have, so we still have, of course, the, the, the domain swapping uh, of ICD2 even in this open conformation. And what is believed to be the, the, the transport mechanism is that the drug that you can see here will try to penetrate inside the, the cell 
it will be captured at the level of the inner plate the entrance gate for the, the, the drug binding site of the transporter. Then there will be ATP that will bind and trigger the dimerization of the two nucleotide binding domains here that will induce the opening of the transporter toward the outside and the release of uh, the drug. So additional structure have been solved for uh, the ABC transporters family, and in particular, one for the uh, pig lycoprotein, so the eukaryotic transporter. Again, this is in an open conformation, so apostate with the two nucleotide binding domains physically separated. So this conformation and the other uh, structures solved uh, led to this uh, hypothetical mechanism for the uh, dimerization of the two nucleotide binding domains. So here you have one nucleotide binding domain, the second one. They are physically disengaged in the apostate and upon ATP binding, this will trigger the dimerization of the two nucleotide binding domain, trapping two ATP molecules at the interface of the two nucleotide binding domain. Uh, then, of course, there will be hydrolysis of the ATP. The transporter will be uh, in this state, ATP bound state, prone to the release of the molecule. Upon ATP hydrolysis, uh, the transporter will open again, ADP will be released, and the transporter will engage in a new cycle of uh, uh, ATPase activity and transport cycle. But of course, in science, there is always controversy, and for instance, this uh, open uh, this open structure, but also the open structure for MSBA that I showed you before. <clears throat> People uh, uh, were, um, said that it might be a, a crystallization artifact or non-functional conformation that has only very transient existence. And additional models were proposed, for instance, this constant contact model here, where in fact the two NBD, so one on the top and one on the bottom, the two NBD always remain in contact. And in fact, you have a slight opening on one side the twin BD that will open and allow the binding of ATP or the release of ADP, and after the transporter will cycle like that between, uh, with an alternating um, cycle between the two nucleotide binding domains, the two ATP binding sites. So I mentioned the, the pig lycoprotein that was uh, discovered in 1976, so in human cell responsible for the, the resistance of cancer cells to the chemotherapies. An homologous transporter was found 20 years later in Lactococcus lactis. So this one works as an homodimer. It was uh, called LMRA, LMRA. And in fact, it was about the time where the first sequencing of a gram-positive bacteria uh, was released. So in 1997 from Bacillus subtilis. And in the genome of Bacillus subtilis, there was a putative transporter called YVCC that showed high level of sequence identity and predicted topology uh, with LMRA. So we got engaged in the study of this transporter and to make a long story short, we have been able to show that BMRA as LMRA function as an homodimer, and this is a multi-drug ABC transporter that by analogy with LMRA, we call BMRA for Bacillus multidrug resistance ATP. So I will just show you an example of two drugs that are transported by BMRA just to, 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 to illustrate the, the polyspecificity of this transporter. So we use a, a very efficient, very high efficient uh, uh, overexpression system uh, from E. coli. And here, this is the gel of membrane, and you can see the native membrane of E. coli, and the E. coli membrane that overexpress BMRA. So you can see that we have a massive overexpression of BMRA in the E. coli membrane. And when we break the E. coli cell in order to purify the transporter, uh, we, we get what, what is called inside-out membrane vesicle. So in that case, the vesicle will recirculate in the uh, inverted conformation. So meaning that the transporter, if it works, it will this time transport the drug inside the uh, lumen of the vesicle. And for instance, we use this property to study the transport of the Ux, so this molecule here. And this molecule is highly fluorescent when it incorporates into a, a lipidic environment. So for instance, sorry. So for instance, the Ux will enter into the, the, the lipid membrane of the vesicle. So the fluorescence will get very high. And then we will add ATP here. The transporter will change its conformation, transport, sorry, transport the molecule inside 
the lumen of the vesicle. So here it will be in an aqueous environment. So the fluorescence of the molecule will decrease. And this slope here uh, 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 reflects the transport activity of the transporter. So here we were able to show the transport of this molecule, but we have another molecule like the doxorubicin, which is also transported by the pig glycoprotein. And using a filtration assay, we can see that the wild type vesicle, they can accumulate very nicely the doxorubicin compound uh, inside the vesicle, whereas a mutated transporter, so on the light, mutated on the lysine, I will come back to this mutant later, you see that we have no color, so no transport activity with this um, mutated transporter. So of course, we can also purify the transporter. So this is uh, uh, the peak that we obtain after gel filtration. And you see that the, the transporter is nicely purified. And we can work with this pu transporter purified in detergent. So in detergent micelle, we can have ATPase activity of about one micromole of ATP hydrolyzed per minute and per milligram. But we can also do, as uh, Gerhard mentioned before, we constitute the protein into proteoliposome or nanodisc. So here you have the example of the nanodisc. So this is a piece of membrane which is held together by the so-called membrane scaffold protein. And you see that when we analyze the two proteins, we have the BMRA protein, which is here, and the membrane scaffold protein, which is down there. So we can work at these two different levels with the BMRA. So the first thing that we wanted to, to do with BMRA is try to probe uh, the two different conformations, so in the apostate and the ATP bound state. And for that, we did a very simple experiment. This is limited proteolysis. So here we use trypsin to do this experiment. And you can see that in the apostate, so presumably, presumably the open conformation here, the transporter in the membrane, so this is the gel for, for uh, of the transporter overexpress in E. coli membrane, you can see that BMRA here is very rapidly digested by the trypsin. So this is true for the apostate. But in contrast, now if we use an inhibitor, which is vanadate, so vanadate in the presence of ADP, it will mimic the ATP bound state that I've shown you before. So meaning that we will have the transporter with the two nucleotide binding domain that interact together and that remain trapped like this. You can see that this, uh, vanadate inhibited state that mimics the ATP bound state. In this state, the transporter is quite resistant to the digestion with uh, trypsin. So this is true at the level of membrane, but we can do the same kind of experiment with the transporter purified in detergent. So here, this is dodecyl mitoside. And you can see that the apostate is rapidly digested, whereas the vanadate inhibited state, so the, the ATP bound state uh, mimic, in that case, the transporter is quite resistant to the digestion. So another thing that we have been using more recently is called the nano-DSF. So the, the DSF stands for differential scanning fluorimetry. And uh, in that case, you can monitor the thermal, thermal denaturation of your protein uh, uh, and so determine the melting temperature. So either for the apostate or the ATP bound state. And you can see that we have a difference uh, between the apostate and the ATP bound state of the, the, the therm thermal uh, the melting temperature goes from about 41 degrees to 49 degrees. And this was done in detergent, but the same holds true for the protein reconstituted into nanodisc here. And in that case, the difference is even much larger. We have about 20 degree difference between the apostate and the ATP bound state. So clearly, we can say that the, the transporter BMRA can switch between two very different conformations in membrane or in detergent, and uh, that show very, um, uh, very different sensitivity towards protease digestion or uh, when we use the, 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 the different short scanning fluorimetry. So then we move the small neutron scattering with uh, our transporter. So in order to do that, you have to find condition that allows you to mask the contribution of uh, uh, the buffer of the detergent, uh, just to, to measure the, 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 what, what is going on for the, the, the diffraction for your protein. And in that case, we use D2 at this uh, percent, 21.5 percent, uh, in the condition where we use a detergent with, which is called LMNG. And this D2 concentration is a construct contrast match point that allows you to mask the detergent contribution. We also use a deuterated protein to have a higher signal 
And this was done in collaboration with Michael Hartline at the D lab at ILL. So the protein was about 70% deuterated in that case. And also what is very important to do this, the, the, those kind of experiments is to have a highly uh, homogeneous protein. So we spent quite a time uh, playing with this factor because at the beginning we had some aggregates and the, the data were not very nice. So what we do now is we do a size exclusion chromatography at the end of the purification to remove the aggregates after the protein is frozen. And when we uh, thought the, the, the protein uh, and just before we do the experiment, the SANS experiment, we do another gel filtration to remove the additional aggregates. And very importantly, at the end of the SANS analysis, we check the sample homogeneity, uh, either by doing uh, analytical ultracentrifugation or uh, size exclusion uh, chromatography coupled to uh, multi-angle light scattering. So it, it allows us to, to, to make sure that the protein was really homogeneous uh, and we didn't have aggregates. So this is the scattering data that you can get from the, the, from the experiments. And in that case, you can see that uh, at low angle here, you have a sort of flatness of uh, the curve. And th this shows that th there is in fact no aggregation of your protein. So one way to present the, the, the results about the, this data is to use the, the pair distance distribution functions. And this is what is shown here for BMRA. And in fact, it gives you an idea of the, the, um, the distribution of the population between different forms of your transporters. So here you have the, the red curve that represents the condition where BMRA was incubated in the presence of uh, AD, uh, ATP, so ending up having ADP and vanadate, so the ATP bound state for the, the transporter. In green, you have the wild type uh, in the apostate. And in yellow, you have the wild type just with ADP this time. And you can see that for the first one, the wild type in the ATP bound form. So we have a curve that shows that the protein is rather compact. And this is compatible with the structure that was obtained for the ATP bound conformation that I've shown you before. Regarding the uh, transporter in the apostate, you can see that we have apparently two sorts of population here. One that would correspond to, the, uh, to, to, to that obtained in the presence of ADP plus vanadate. But we have also a conformation that seems to be uh, more open in a certain manner. And this is compatible with what we believe occurs for the transporter in the, the apostate. But most surprisingly was the result that we obtained in the presence of ADP. In the, with ADP, we have this peak right here that will fit nicely with what we see for the wild type in the, the apostate. But we have mostly this peak here, the first one that seems to, to, to the shoulder that seems to vanish, to disappear in the ATP band conformation. So at least it seems that the ATP band conformation is a little bit wider, maybe more open than what occurs in the case of the, the, the ATP band, uh, the, I'm sorry, the apostate of the transporter. Uh, so we did also the, the, this, this experiment with two different mutants. So this mutant here, the glutamate mutant, it's an inactive mutant, but it can still bind ATP. In fact, ATP will bind to this mutant. It will induce the dimerization of the two uh, nucleotide binding domain, and the transporter will remain trapped in this ATP bound conformation. So with the two ATP molecules trapped at the interface. And when we compare the data for this mutant with the, those that we obtain with uh, the wild type in the presence of ADP and vanadate, you can see that the curve, the, the sine curve and the red curve are, are rather similar. So the, the two conformations are, are look alike for the, the wild type and the mutant. Uh, regarding the apostate in blue here, the mutant, it looks also rather similar to the one that we obtain with the, the, the wild type. Then we, we, we did also the experiment for another mutant. This is a, the Lazy mutant, this one. And this one is unable to hydrolyze ATP. It will bind ATP, but with a rather low affinity. And in fact, when it binds the ATP, this is the curve in, uh, in uh, pink here. In fact, it seems that we have a sort of intermediate uh, situation. So it looks like the two uh, nucleotide binding domains are, are, are getting closer than what we can get here in the, the the apostate of the transporter. So of course, here the sketch, you see the, the transporter is widely open, but it doesn't mean that this is the case with our transporter. We believe that the, the, the opening is much shorter in the case of, uh, of BMRA. So 
to, to, to sum up the, the results uh, that we obtain by different techniques, but in particular by sounds, this is what we believe that occurs for BMRA. So here you have the two separated nucleotide binding domain in the apostate of the transporter. Upon ATP binding, this will trigger the dimerization of the two nucleotide binding domain with two molecules of ATP uh, trapped at the interface of the transporter. Upon ATPase activity, so hydrolysis, ADP will be formed, the transporter will open again, and then the cycle will go on. Regarding the mutant, so we have the glutamate mutant here, which is capable to bind ATP. ATP will induce the dimerization, but there will be no uh, hydrolysis that can occur. So the mutant will be trapped in this conformation, ATP bound conformation. And for the second mutant, the lysine mutant, this one too can bind ATP, but we believe that this mutant remains this, this conformation. So the ATP, the binding of ATP cannot trigger the dimerization of these two domains. So this mutant stays trapped in this conformation. So we are in the process of making model of the different uh, uh, um, uh, possible structure of BMRA that we, that we have. In fact, we, we get recently by cryo-EM and by uh, um, X-ray diffraction, the structure of this mutant in the ATP bound state, but we are making models of, of the different structure. And in particular, what is very interesting, it seems from the SANS data that we obtained that the ADP bound state of the transporter will not be this conformation, but rather this conformation where the two nucleotide binding domains are rather uh, uh, a little bit more separated. And maybe the apostate will look more similar to this scheme here. Finally, I would like to thank people who have come to this talk. So, Sylvain, Wakas, Marie Pierre, Cédric, and Margot. And also, so their, their name is indicated here. Uh, this is the other people of the lab, but they work on, on different projects. And also, I would like to acknowledge a long standing collaboration with Christine Ebel and Cécile Breton at the IBS and with Anne Martel for all the ILL experiments that were done, the, the, the experiment ILL, the, the SANS data. Uh, I would like to thank also the founding bodies, uh, ANR and Finovi, and the, the, uh, also the CNRS and the university. And uh, I thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm open to questions, of course. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so um, I had uh, a question a bit le uh, linked to our lens project. Do you think you have uh, specific interactions with some lipids from these transporters? Is it known from uh, other... So for our transporter, we don't know. We've never studied that. But uh, in the case of the pig glycoprotein, so the, the homologous transporter from eukaryotic cells, uh, there was a, a paper uh, last year of the group of Kaspar Locher, and he showed that there was some interaction with the cholesterol and also phosphatidyl ethanolamine. And regarding the um, LMRA transporter that I mentioned, uh, Previously, it has been shown, apparently, that it's capable to transport phosphatidyl ethanolamine in addition to drugs, of course. So, possibly, there is uh, interaction uh, with lipid as substrate, but also maybe some uh, specific lipids to help the structuration of the transporter. So that, that, that's a possibility. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read the, the questions uh, that the attendees are asking. So, uh, one is from uh, is about the SANS data treatment. So, did you use uh, Damin or Dunford uh, to get a low resolution uh, structure of the protein? So, I will not be able to answer the question because you did the, the, the treatment <laughs> of the data, uh, and so I guess you, you will answer. <laughs> Yeah, so it's in the uh, in process, but um, it seems that we have a mixture of several uh, uh, conformations. And so I'm using Multifox to fit the data right now. 
uh, but it sends data, so well, it's it's in process. It's going to come soon. But yes, we are doing some. So uh, Damin only enabled us to have a good uh, model for the ATP bound state, which is the very closed state and very stable actually. And the other seems to be much more floppy, and we couldn't have one model for for the. So maybe something that I should add regarding the, the flexibility of the protein in the apostate is that we have also done experiments, so HD exchange that we monitor by mass spectrometry. So exchanging the proton with the, the, the deuterium. And in that case, we, we can also see that the, the, the transporter in the apostate is quite flexible, actually. So th this is probably why we have, let's say, some difficulty to really uh, uh, to, to, to really say that the transporter can be uh, open in one single state. Of course, there are multiple states for the transporter in the apostate. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, I see another question, which is probably valid for both uh, speakers. Also, it was more asked for uh, Gerhard, but uh, someone is asking, what are the NMR time scale? of bugs and uh, and the other proteins you're studying and could they be uh, studied by uh, neutron spin echo or backscattering or dynamics uh, experiments neutron dynamic yeah. experiments and normally with this experiment i showed it's around millisecond time scale on the nmr and the neutron i do not know how sensitive it is for this time scale so, so i have to ask luke or hannah or some neutron expert <laughs> So maybe I can answer, I think uh, for BMRA, uh, it's, it's some, uh, the, the nucleotide binding domain seems to be very floppy and it's probably in the uh, nanosecond time scale, I would say. But the problem for using neutron spin echo, unfortunately, is the sample amount. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, uh, yeah, the, the amount that are used for sans or reflectivity are uh, fractions of milligrams. Uh, and for neutron spin echo, I think it's uh, still uh, 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So for the moment, we are limited on this, uh, on this aspect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Are there other questions from the attendees? Or? Ah, yes, so the, the attendees who asked the questions uh, says, thank you for the answer. Let's wait for the new neutron source ESS. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, yes, that will be better. Uh, I see another question. Do you see some flexibility on your cryo EM data? Uh, so I, I think it's for Jean Michel Jo. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, it's hard to say because we have selected a population of uh, in the cryo EM. So maybe there are a second population that we do not see, very minor. In fact, in that case, we use the ATP bound state. So the mutant that will trap the ATP at the interface. So this, this conformation is rather stable, but of course we cannot exclude uh, that, um, uh, that we are missing part of the transporter, which is in a minor conformation that, that, that was not selected for the analysis of the data. Uh, so we, there, there, there is some flexibility that we, that we see in the um, in, in the X-ray structure of the transporter, so there are, are parts that are disordered and that we are suspecting that they are flexible. And in fact, we have the experiment, the HD exchange experiment by mass spectrometry, that confirmed that we have some flexibility at, at so, certain point. So that when the transporter in this is in this outward facing conformation, in fact, it's some part of the, the transmembrane uh, helices. At, uh, located at the outside of the transporter that seems to be ra rather flexible, more flexible than in the apostate. Okay, thank you. I hope it uh, answers the question. Uh, indeed, the cryo-EM will, uh, uh, will be a really good uh,
tool for the uh, for the flexibility, but I think it's still difficult to really be sure of the number of the confirmation you can select and so on. Um, so, so we are trying actually to 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 to, to get now the structure in the apostate of the transporter, but it's more complicated, possibly due, due to the, the multiple state uh, that it, it can adopt. Okay. Uh, okay, do we have other questions? It seems not. So, well, I guess we can close the... the ah, yes, one more question. I think there is a, another one, but I cannot see which one it is. Should neutron facilities improve their support for life science research with neutron and attract the community? And if so, how? So a new case, uh, both of you, uh, what, what do you see that could help you doing experiment at the at neutron facilities? Christmas list. <laughs> I mean, you you need ex you need help people at the facilities who support you a lot. I mean, like I came there, I didn't have any clue about anything, so I think Luke and Hannah were essential to get it working and also working the first time. So you need extremely good and also I interested in the systems. But like an NMR person, when I was doing my postdoc in Oxford, so our NMR machines was close to the ISIS, 200 meters away, but I only picked up helium. I didn't know that I would ever end at the ISIS to measure there many years <laughs> later. And we thought, and this is a different technique. This is nothing you say, it's not like a UV spectrometer, you buy and run it. Mm -hmm. really quite a lot. And it needs a lot of effort. It needs also effort to travel and all this other stuff. So it's not... Uh, Easy accessible technique. Now my crystallography people, they send the crystals to Max Lab 4 or Diamond or anything or to Grenoble. But they do not even have to travel themselves anymore. And this is like with this neutral reflectivity, still also a lot of on-site lab work with the membranes. No, I think of course we, we, we need to, to, to have experts in, in these techniques and I think, well, as Gerhard said, this is, this, this is a very peculiar technique. So the, uh, so, 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 so the, the expertise is absolutely required. And, uh, uh, but above that, I think any kind of techniques, when you can use one technique, if you, you, you can associate with other approaches, I think it's, it's, it's again in science in general, because you always want to confirm results that you obtain by, with one technique with another one. So that's, uh, that's how we make progress in the understanding of the, the biological function of molecules. So, all the techniques are, that are available, are, are, you, you need to try them if you can, if you have the, the, the material, the, 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 the protein to do that. So, of course. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you would say local expertise plus eventually remotely remote experiments, but... I don't know if it's possible so easy, except for our stuff, you still have to decide a lot of ad hoc. But for the, my crystallography <laughs> colleagues, Crystal standard to send is very rarely to go. So send 100 crystals and have a robot and run it. But I think like with our membranes, we often use the measurements. We have to see what we have to change during the experiment. And this is not possible if you say you send it before and then they do it. Not so easy. And then it's also from the work. I mean, we cannot travel each second week to a neutron source. I think this is we thought once a year with, or twice. It's more is okay because we all the other I mean, NMR is in house big, this you can do, but this is still also a technique which needs a lot of effort also from the university side because it's really a complex technique. There's nothing which goes quickly. Also, the analysis, the analysis is another black hole to understand how to analyze this data. Okay, so maybe would you be interested in having more, more training? for students to be able to understand these black holes? <laughs> yeah, partially, I thought Anna and Luca get some out because once I wanted to register for course, but I was, as a professor, was not allowed to do that. It was only PhDs <laughs> and postdocs for a long course. Yeah. <laughs> but I downloaded all the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, so regarding the question that we that Gerhard had about the NMR, maybe I can mention something that we have done with the uh, with BMRS, so not ourselves, but but in collaboration with NMR people. So it's uh, when you reconstitute the protein in bilayer or in liposome, then you can do you can do a solid state NMR in that case. Mm -hmm. And especially okay. for a large protein like BMRS, so it's 65 kilo Dalton. I think you can do. Uh, 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 normal NMR, but in that case, the signal are probably uh, not very good at all. So you you, you will not, not get any uh, structural information on such a large protein, as far as I understand. But with solid state NMR, you can. So solution mice is a problem. If you have a membrane protein detergent, they're quite big micelles and they tumble to slow. So you get not sharp lines and are quite broad and bad resolution. Uh, unless you can do specific labeling, for, yes. possibly with a fluorinated amino acid or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's no more questions. <coughs> well, I thank you both for, for your very good talk. And... Uh, Thank uh, all the attendees for, for listening. And uh, so I hope to have another Lens webinar soon. <laughs> okay. And, uh, well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Continue you to interact. Okay. Thank you very much. Salut. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.